So today we're going to do just a little Bible study. Is that okay? It's a Bible study today. And the title of my sermon is Revival. Do you need it? Do you need it? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you once again for the ability to be up here. But Lord, I don't want to be here. I need you to be standing next beside me. Lord, let the words that come out of my mouth be the words that you want me to say. And let the ears receive them. And Lord, let us all be changed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, in every generation throughout the world, in every generation, the Spirit brings revival to your heart. The Spirit brings it. Revival is an, it's an ongoing process. It happens every day, all the day. You know, you go to bed, you wake up in the morning, you have to start all over again. It's a daily experience. Now, there's a hymn that I really love this hymn, which kind of gives me an idea of what revival is all about. It talks about our condition, you know, because revival has to do with who we are and, and what we do. It explains our condition perfectly. I'm not going to sing the song. I'm going to give you a break on that. However, I do want to read a few of the words from the last couple of stanzas. It's come down fount of every blessing. You know the song. You know the song. So the last couple of verses says, O to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter, chains, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Hear my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. What a statement. Our hearts are prone to wander. I mean, I, I am amazed sometimes how my mind just goes off in different directions that I don't really want to go. I have little control over some of my thoughts. And one minute I'm thinking about heaven, I'm thinking about, man, one day we're going to be in heaven and sitting there with the Lord and asking him all these questions and just enjoying the time there. And next minute, all the problems of life, all the things that I'm dealing with at work, at home, circumstances, distracts me. It distracts you too. You know, we are in bondage because of our circumstance, our daily lives, our habits, things that we have grown accustomed to doing that we probably need to break away from so we can concentrate on following Jesus and knowing who the Lord is. Now, I'm amazed, though. I have little control over some of my thoughts. I'm baffled by my weakness. Sometimes, you know, I think, you know how you think you're strong? You know, I'm finding out as I get older, Things I used to do, I mean, simple things like picking up a 40-pound bag of cement. You know, I'd go to Home Depot, get that 40-pound bag of cement and bring it home. I get that 40-pound bag of cement now, and it feels like it weighs 80 pounds. I'm, I'm amazed. You know, all those things, but so I'm becoming weaker in strength, but I need to become stronger in mind. Let's see how uh, Jeremiah explains it. Jeremiah has a way of talking about this that kind of gives us a little clearer view. We're going to go to Jeremiah. Uh, and it's, this is the Amplified Version. I'm using the Amplified Version in a couple of places because it explains things well. But I just want to remind you, when you study, study from the King James. Jeremiah 7, 19. Thus saith the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in the re and relies on mankind, making weak, faulty human flesh his strength, and whose mind and heart turn away from the Lord says, if you're going to put your trust in man, I don't care who it is, if you put your trust in man, it's going to make you weak because you're trusting in the wrong thing. Jeremiah says, because we trust in mankind who is faulty and weak, am I saying amen? Amen. <laughs> Our mind will turn away from God. It's so easy. The devil understands that. Distractions are his favorite tool. He wants us to be distracted so that we won't be concerned with all these things around us, you know. He wants us to get distracted so we can forget about our future. You know what your future is? Your future is in heaven. It's been written down when you were born. You get to choose, though, if you want to go. It's a choice. Isaiah 53, 6 explains it like this. He says, all of us are sheep, like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way, 
but the Lord has caused the wickedness of us all, wickedness all our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing, to fall on him instead of us. All of our wickedness, all of our injustice, all our weakness will fall on him. He came so that we didn't have to go through everything by ourselves. I say it's all, it's every one of us. Every one of us has gone astray. But if he is sent, he's going to send us a savior to take our punishment if we choose to allow him to do so. Does anybody want to take their own punishment? I don't think so. If Christ wants to take it, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Today we're going to talk about our condition. It's our condition. Because we must understand what we are capable of. I don't think sometimes we really realize some of the things we're capable of until a certain thing happened. Some things come out of our mouth at certain times that we would not have uttered, but we were surprised or shocked or something that came out. We may think we're not too bad because, you know, we don't drink, you know, or we don't lie, we haven't murdered anybody. And, and in my opinion, you know, you're pretty good. You know, you, you passed the test for the, the top three or four things. But the Bible says this in Romans 7.24. Romans 7.24 says, Wretched and miserable man that I am, who shall rescue me and set me free from this body of death? This corrupt, mortal existence. This is Paul talking. The Apostle Paul. The one who would walk through the streets and his shadow would fall on people and they would be healed. He's asking God to help him get rid of this mortal existence so he can, he can do better. He recognizes, although he has a great relationship with the Lord, it can't be better. Paul's understanding that his condition is corrupt and a mortal existence. A mortal existence is one that does not go to heaven. See, without Jesus, there is no eternity. All we're doing here is, is mocking time. And the time that we spend on earth is just a blink. A blink. I don't care if it's 100 years. It's a blink in terms of eternity. Our plea should be as David. Psalms 119, 159. This is David. His plea should be our plea. And David says... Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. David says he wants to be revived. He understands God's precepts. He loves God's word. He wants to be revived. What does it mean to be revived? What is revival? Here's what it says in the dictionary. Revival is an improvement in the condition or strength of something. Improvement or condition of something. It's an improvement. From the spiritual standpoint, though, this is what David was trying to say. David was asking God to improve his relationship, his spiritual relationship. That is the condition that he's talking about. See, he loves God's precepts. He loves God's word. Because he loves God's word, he wants the Lord to improve his relationship. You know, sometimes we don't recognize our relationship. We may think it's someplace that it's not. You know, revival is all about God who loves you and wants to have a deeper relationship with you. Revival is about initiating that relationship. So you and me, I was, I was talking to Brother Noah last week. Hey, Brother Noah. <laughs> and last week, we were discussing him. I was telling him how I went on a three-day marriage seminar back in the 80s when we were first married, me and my wife. A weekend to remember is what it's called. And I was tricked. I was fooled. It wasn't just me. It was me and four of the guys, couples. We were told we were going to a hotel for three days. We were just going to go out and have a good time and do some things. And we were like, yeah, let's, let's do it. So we all got together to go out there. And when we got there, we found out. It was a marriage seminar. Woo, I was hot. Oh, man, I, I, I tell you, I would have left. I would not have stayed. I was really upset, except for I'd already paid my money. So I'm not going nowhere. You know, you know, I, I paid my money. I'm going to go. It was right in Reston. It was, it was something else. And we went there, and you can imagine, we were thinking that it was going to be bad. It was the best weekend I ever had. 
I learned stuff from people that I didn't even know I needed to learn. And it was a great time for us. The thing is, God wants the same thing for us. You know, he, he understands that we need to improve our relationship. And he knows that for some reason, we're not going to be ones to initiate it. And I was thankful that my wife and her friends thought to initiate us to go on that weekend because it really was needed, and I didn't know it. So our God wants our relationship to be with him so much that he will initiate revival in you. You don't have to worry about trying to initiate it. He's going to turn on a switch in you that's going to cause you to want to know him better or to cause you to recognize exactly where your relationship with him. It is the spirit that creates this longing for revival in you. It is the spirit that convicts us of our need. It is the spirit that reveals Jesus' goodness and his grace. Of ourselves, we would not have it. So he puts it in you, but you still get a choice. Do you want to indulge in it, or do you want to push it aside? See, throughout history, God's spirit has moved mightily for revival. I mean, there was a time when, when Israel was, was going away, and, and he talked to King Josiah, and Josiah caused a revival, and a whole nation came back to him. It was a mighty revival back then. At the dedication service at the temple, Solomon, in, in, in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, said this to him. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I shall hear from heaven. He's telling us, look, here's the choice. If you just do a little bit, you know, he didn't say took 360, go all the way around. Just, just, just this way. I will continue to help you as you move forward. We have to recognize our condition. Today, I want you to think about your condition. It doesn't mean that you don't have a relationship with the Lord. It doesn't mean that you don't know who he is, but everybody's relationship can improve. I've been married almost 40 years. And I tell you, if I go back to that weekend to remember again, I'm going to learn something I didn't know already. God's heart is longing for Israel to get back together. He wants them to meet his conditions for revival. He's going to install it in you. He's going to give you the conditions where you have to meet for this revival. To experience his power and to experience his grace. He's going to reveal his light of love in the world through you. Now, now, when God, people respond his, to his appeal and revival, he works mighty on your behalf. I mean, think about the things that he's done when people came back to revival. It was true of the New Testament church. You know, when the apostles came together and recognized that they needed to, to, to be on one accord, and he went into the, uh, the upper room, the revival there was amazing. Back in the Reformation, when the Bible was chained to the, to the pulpit and no one knew who it was, he caused those people to have revival and understand. When the Adventist church came together, they came together understanding that we need a better relationship with the God, with Lord. What we've been doing is not what he wants us to do. He wants us to worship on a certain day. He wants us to eat a certain way. He wants us to be together. And that revival came through and he helped in that revival. He's also going to come through and help us at the end time. Now, I'm not telling you the end time is tomorrow, but I'm not sure how much time we got. But I'm not going to play around thinking like I got a lot. We need to deal with it like it's real today. Today, I want to talk about our need for revival. That's the goal, our need for revival. Whatever your relationship is, the Lord's revival can bring you even closer. How many want a closer walk with God? I do. The sermon today is just a Bible study. So let me start off with a quote from Ellen White. See, Ellen White describes something very important, and these are her words. She says, A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all needs. The greatest and most urgent of all needs. 
Now, I mean, we all have priority lists. We think that we need to do this first and this second, this third, and we have our list and we go through. But sometimes what we have as number one shouldn't be number one. She's saying that true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all needs. The most urgent. Now, it's not paying our mortgage. It's not making sure our kids get a good education. It's not even making sure we have the right food to eat. All these things are good things. You know, we want to eat good food. We want to have a healthy body. We want our kids to be educated. We want to live in a nice home that we don't have to pay a lot for. All these things are important. But what good is a beautiful house? What good is your children with a PhD? What good is if your body is so well developed because you've eaten the right foods and everything, if when Christ comes to the clouds, you want to run and hide? What good is it? Today I want you to take a look at the church of Laodicea. Laodicea is the last church in Revelation's sequence of churches that it went through. There were seven that it talked about. And Laodicea was the last one. And Laodicea means a judged people. A judge people. These are people that God is going to judge, just like he's going to judge us. That's why they, they look at Laodicea and they say, you know what? We are the Laodicean church. We will be judged. It's also a fitting symbol for God's last day church people. Let me give you some information about Laodicea. Now, Laodicea is located in Turkey, southern western part of Turkey. And it was an important financial um, capital. Through Laodicea, they had so many trails going through it that commerce and, and, and business went through that place that it was financially set. I mean, think of L.A., New York, Washington, you know, set. Traffic's coming through there, they're doing well. It was also a financial mecca, I mean, a, a, a fashion mecca. If you wanted the latest clothes, you went to Laodicea. They were setting fashion trends. Almost like if you went to, to, to Italy or somewhere, or, or New York in the garment distance. You go to the garment distance down in New York, if you've ever been there, you see why they call it that. There are so many clothes and things going back and forth. Yep. It was also an educational and, med and medical center. If you wanted some education, you'd go to Laodicea. Those people had schools and universities to teach you. They had medical centers that you can get help if you were ill and trained to be ill in the latest technical things of their time. No, they wasn't doing brain surgery, but they were doing some things that were amazing in Laodicea. That's where you had to be. The inhabitants there, well, they were independent. They were self-confident. Can you imagine? I'm not worried about the government. I got my own money. You know, I'm independent. I'm self-confident. I can handle my own stuff. This was Laodicea. They didn't need anything. And finally, they were rich. I mean, comparatively to what we have now, they were rich. They had need for nothing. Zero. And because of that, the educational system, the financial system, you know, everything. They, they didn't really have the strong desire or the need for a savior. They had everything they needed, but the vital thing that they didn't have in Laodicea, they didn't have one thing. They didn't have a water source. The water that went to Laodicea had to be come across aqueducts. It was a five-mile aqueduct doc, that was built all the way to Laodicea, and the water was traveling down this aqueduct to Laodicea, and that's where they got their water from. But the water, when it got there, because of the long distance it traveled, was warm. It was warm water. The water was so warm that this is why Christ used it as his theme. He sees says, by the time the water reached Laodicea, it was lukewarm. So Jesus used this symbol to represent a lukewarm condition. Wow. His last day church described as this, self-confident, complacent, apathetic, and spiritually indifferent. Those are hard words. Self-confident, complacent, apathetic, spiritually indifferent. It is a church 
that had lost its passion. You know what this passion is? All, all of us have one. I mean, it could be with anything. It could be sports. Your passion is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a golfer. I love playing golf, you know. If somebody asks you to play golf, yeah, I want to play, you know. But their passion should be to know more about Christ. Their passion should be more spiritual, but they were indifferent. It is the church that needed spiritual revival, a better relationship. It was a church that checked the boxes, you know. I did this, I did that, moved on. They go home after the box is checked and do nothing during the week. Just check the box. Does it describe our church? Or better, does it describe you? Do you believe that you need revival? Do you believe that you need to improve your spiritual relationship or your spiritual condition? I know I do. Today, I want you to take a look at the church of Laodicea. They can be found in Revelations chapter 3, and this is where our study is going to start. This is going to be a short sermon, but I want you to understand your condition and take a look at where you are in terms of Christ. Revelations 3, verses 14 through 16, as we go through and read it, it's in the Amplified Version once again. Let's read together. And to the angel, excuse me, and to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. Ooh. That you are neither hot, neither cold, nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Vomit you. Ooh, what a vision. See, verse 14 is there to identify who John is talking to. Is there to identify that, that this is not coming out of John. This is coming from Jesus. The one who spoke the words that came into being. He's the one who created the earth. He's the one who spoke into the existence. And this same Jesus speaks to the hope of Laodicea. This is the Jesus that spoke these things to. This is the amen. The same Jesus also created the new spiritual longings within all of our hearts. He's putting it within us to want to have a better relationship with the Lord. Now, you can transform your spiritual lives if you want him to. He can do that for you. So it is important to understand who is giving the words to John because we need to give it that level of importance that we all need to. You know, it's different if somebody says something to you. My wife is good at this. You know, who told you that? Because whoever told you that will give credibility to what they're saying. You know, if you heard it from your friend James, James is a crackpot. Don't believe nothing he said. You know, nah. you know but I said, you know, I got out the Bible. I said, oh, okay, what, what did it say? Who said that? This is important. Jesus is speaking to John. John is giving it to us. It's for us. So it's important for us to stand who, who John is talking to. Verse 15 and 16 says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That, that is a vision. All of us had a time when we had an upset stomach and we were, you know, hugging the portal, Paul, Paul said, God, as they used to say, you know. But God is saying, because of your condition, you're not over here, you're not over here, you're playing somewhere in the middle, I can't do nothing with you. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Here's what Ellen says. It says, the message to the Laodicean church applies most decidedly to those whose religious experience is insidious. Ooh, what a big word. Who do not hear, bear, or describe witnesses in favor of truth. Insidious. Insidious. I should ask my teachers what this means. I know they know. The Bible says, the fascination of Satan and, and the insidious religion experience is one that is lifeless. There's no life in your experience. There's no, no vigor. There's nothing in there. It has the further 
husk. It's like you have the outer experiment of, of Christianity. You look, you're looking good. You know, I see you. You're looking good. I see what you're doing. You're looking good. But inside, inside, the Laodiceans lack substance. They weren't heretics. You know, they, they weren't fanatics. They weren't over here. They weren't over there. They weren't fiery fanatics. They weren't any of those things. They were simply spiritually indifferent. You know, you, you meet those people in the street and you might ask them, you know, who, who are you pulling for, Democrats, Republicans? I don't care. Whoever wins. It's indifferent. I don't care. Whoever, whatever goes. That's where they were. It's not talking about anyone here, though. Nobody here is spiritually indifferent. These are the Laodiceans. That's who we're talking about. The Laodiceans appear to be good moral people. They have what Paul calls the form of godliness. The form of godliness, but the denying the power thereof. It's just a form. You know, I'm amazed. You know, I've told this story all the time because it always comes to me. You know, I've told you before about my sons when they were growing up. I would come home, and they would say, Daddy's coming. So they would hide. They'd try to hide. But, you know, sometimes I'd come in too quick, and they couldn't hide. So they would just stand still. <laughs> stand still. They wouldn't move. <laughs> As if I couldn't see them. And I'm walking around, where's Monty? Where is he? You know, that's how, that's how we treat God. We do things, say things as if he can't see or hear us, that he doesn't know. And he's looking right at you. You know, <laughs> when the Pharisees kept trying to put him in a trap, all he was doing was looking at the sign that was above their head saying, they're trying to trap you, don't believe nothing they say. Move forward. Paul says they have a form of godliness with denying the power thereof. Jesus speaks to the religion of people in Matthew 5, 15, verse 8. He describes the condition of these people as this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, They draw near to him, me, their mouth and honor him, me, that's Jesus, but their lips and their hearts are far from him, Jesus. They draw near to him, right? Their mouths honor him, right? But their hearts, what they're really thinking, is far from him. Church, we need to have more than just a form of godliness. We need to have revival with our relationship with Jesus. I don't care where your relationship is. If it's way up there, you can take it another step higher. If it's at the bottom, you can get He puts the desire within our hearts to have this revival. Now, this is a hard rebuke. I know it is. No one wants to be called out like this. They don't want to be called uh, a fake or a hypocrite, you know. Every parent, I know every parent who understands these words, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. As a kid, you don't understand that. But as a parent, you do. Because discipline is not fun. Discipline is not what you want to be. You want to have a loving relationship with your child. But sometimes discipline is necessary. And it's necessary to give them a wake-up call, you know, to give them the punishment or chastisement is not what we parents want to do. See, our love, Lord loves his people too. You know. He doesn't want us to go into lawlessness or sin. So he gives us these rebukes to wake us up and say, wait a minute. Our relationship is not where it should be. Let's check that. I'm going to put into you a longing to have a better relationship with me. He would do whatever. And when I say whatever, I mean whatever. He would do whatever it takes to spark a spiritual flame in your heart. And sometimes we go through some hard stuff, and we ask, why, Lord, why? He said, I'm trying to get you to turn around. I'm trying to get you to see me. I want you to be on your back so when you look up, you recognize who I am. His strong rebuke is because he has strong love for you, strong love. His chest mind is only because he is longing to heal us See, the prophet Hosea 6.1, Hosea says this. He says, says, come and let us return to the Lord. For he, has, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He was stricken, but he will bind us up. He says, you know, he, he understands that we're 
messed up, he, that we're torn, that we're broke, but he wants to bind us up. Although he gave you the chastisement to recognize he is Lord, he now is going to fix you. So as Jesus is explaining the problem, lukewarm Christians, okay, neither hot nor cold, okay, form of godliness, denying the power thereof, okay, imagine somebody, I thought about this, imagine, you know, someone walks up to you and says, there's, there's, a, there's an odor coming from you, you know, and they're trying to tell you there's something wrong with you, but you you don't know what you're talking about. I don't smell nothing. Keep moving on. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you know what? You have an issue. I'm going to point it out to you, and I'm going to give you a solution to it. You know, he wants us to understand our condition. The problem is, you know, nobody here goes to the doctor if they're not sick. Right? I mean, <laughs> you, don't, you don't go ask for help if you don't need it. But he wants us to go ask for help because he recognizes we need it. Verse 17 of Revelation tells us how the people of Laodicea see themselves. Now, we've heard how God sees them. This is how they see themselves. Verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased in goods, and have need of nothing, and knoweth not Thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Wait a minute. Woo! How can you not recognize this? You're blind, you're poor, and naked. See, the thing is, he's not talking about your financial status. He's not talking about your educational status. He's not talking about the things that you have. He's talking about your spiritual condition. Your spiritual condition is blind, naked, miserable, and poor. They're clueless. We have to be careful that we don't get to a point where we are believing our own hype. You know, as we look in the mirror, we see ourselves and we, you know, I'm not so bad, looking okay, you know, got, you know, and we get to the point where, you know, God is just a thing that we bring up as a talking point to let people understand that we know Jesus, but may not really know, know him. You know, God's help will help you if you need it. He'll help you if you believe you need it. We have to care not to believe our own height. When we find ourselves, there's a gap between what the lay to see and see and what a Laodicean does, you know? The gap between what we see, who we are, and what we really do. There's even greater gap between the spiritual experience of Laodicea. It's a bigger experience between what their spiritual experience is and what it actually is. See, one of Satan's fatal deceptions is to blind us. Now, when I say blind us, I don't mean physically blind you. He puts in front of you things that you won't see other things going on. He gets you busy during the week. You know, you got run the kids to school, you got food to cook, you got to go to work, you got to clean the house, you got clothes to wash, you got this, you got that, all these things to do. Distracts you from all, and you don't have time to do one prayer. Don't have time to read the Bible, not one time. You don't have time to discuss with your children things of the Bible sometimes because he gets you distracted. It's not what you wanted to do. That's not what you meant to do. But he understands that if he can keep you on a treadmill, your relationship with the Lord will not be what it needs to be. He blinds us in the reality of our spiritual need. He blinds us to it, that you don't really recognize that you're in need of a revival. He blinds us. Some of the liturgies in Jesus' days, the same thing were happening. They were blinded by their own spiritual poverty. They didn't even know that they were in trouble. I mean, they were Bible reading. They were Sabbath keeping. They were tithe paying church people. Members who looked exactly like the Laodiceans. They recognized that the Messiah was coming, but they were in darkness. 
They wanted him to come the way they wanted him to come. And they were blind to the fact that he was standing right there in front of them. Standing right there. Talking to them. Didn't see it. Are we in that same boat? We need to be careful. As many are in darkness regarding the type of spiritual kingdom he would usher in. They just don't understand that it's happening. Jesus called them blind guides. This is what the Pharisees and Sadducees were blind guides. They were supposed to be guiding people to Jesus or to, to the Messiah, but they were blind. They didn't know. Matthew 23, 24 says this. Paul writes to the church of Corinth about, the, about those spiritually blind guides. He says, who strain out a gnat, consuming yourselves with minuscule matters, and swallow a camel, ignoring the, and violating the God's, God's precepts. They, they look at the little bitty things, little bitty things that you're doing wrong. You know, you pick your part about this, that, that, and the other thing, and the, and, and the bigger things they don't even see. Jesus will restore the spiritual eyesight. That's what he needs. He's going to restore our spiritual eyesight and, and have you follow him through. That's what needs to happen. Every time Jesus opened a blind man's eyes in the New Testament, it wasn't just for him to see. It's a metaphor for everybody that was blind. The blind person saw, but the people who can see also saw. They saw that he was the Messiah. Now he, it was opened up for them. Eyes open, minds in order to enable to see him clearly. Clearly, now you can see him clearly. There's hope for Leah to see him, though. There's hope. Just as there's hope for who, who you are. Afflicted with spiritual apathy, indifference, if that's where you are, there's hope. There's hope for us. The Lord has a divine remedy. I love that. A remedy. How many like a good remedy? You know, a good fix. You know, I work in computers all the time. I love a good fix. Ah, it's fixed. The problem is now gone. The fact that the Lord speaks to his church shows the hope that he has exists. You know, if he didn't speak to us, he didn't talk to us, you couldn't hear him. If there was nothing coming, that means we're in trouble. That means, you know, that, they talk about how the, if you, uh, the Holy Spirit, if you just keep pushing him away and keep pushing him away, his voice gets smaller, 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 smaller. You don't hear him anymore. Now you're in trouble. But if you can still hear him, you still have hope. It is his people accept the following counsel. And the following counsel is found in Revelation 3, verses 18 and 19. Here's the counsel. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold that has been heated, red hot, refined by fire, so that you may become truly rich. Truly rich. He says, and white clothes representing righteousness to clothe yourself so that the shame of your nakedness will not be seen. Amen. And healing salve to put on your eyes so that you may see. 19 says, those whom I dearly and tenderly love, this is Jesus talking, love I, love, I rebuke and discipline, showing them the faults and instructions, instructing them so that be enthusiastic and repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior. Seek God's will. That's all we got to do. We got to ask the Lord for a better relationship with him. And we got to be willing to do what it takes to have that. You know, you, you, you all have relationship with people. If you don't call somebody but once a year, that relationship's going to be on level one. You call them twice a month, maybe level four. You talk to them every day, you're on ten, nine or ten. That's what it takes to have a better relationship with the Lord. Reading his Bible, praying, here in church, doing some works outside of church. Revelation 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock of the church. And continually knock. <laughs> if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, restore him, and he with me. 
Do you hear Jesus knocking on your door? Hey, Reggie, you in there? No, you over there? Claude, can I come in? Jesus is going from door to door. He's knocking on our doors. And he's standing there in front of every person in this room. He's there proclaiming, I stand at the door and knock. Answer the door. Answer it. He opens his treasures and cries, buy of me gold. Buy from him good gold, not refined gold. Gold is not mixed with anything else. Pure gold that's been tried in the fire. Get it from him. He says, put on this white raiment. The white raiment is, is his, own, his own cloak. He puts around you so that you can have righteousness. You can be clothed. You won't be naked. You know, some of us don't realize it, but we ain't wearing no clothes. Spiritual clothes, that is. The gold Jesus offers is without alloy, it says. Nothing mixed in it. Nothing. It's pure. It's precious gold. The white raiment invites you is to wear is his own robe as you put it around him. We all need that spiritual eye salve too. Because once he puts that in our eyes, we will look out there and we will see things we never saw before. We'll recognize good in people instead of evil. We recognize how to help someone instead of, eh, they can fix it on their own. We recognize that we can do more than what we're doing. We recognize and we hear that Christ wants us to be a certain type of person right now, right today. We need to be able to distinguish between working of the Holy Ghost and God and the spirit of the enemy. Sometimes we get confused. We think we're doing God's will. The devil's just laughing at us, got us out there doing crazy stuff. Jesus wants us to open the door and let him in. It is our Redeemer who counsels you to buy gold. You know, I was going through this sermon this week, and I recognized revival. Man, I need a revival. You know, it's usually this time of year that we have one. And I know my son who, who plays at, in West Virginia says they're going to have one. I said, I want to go there because you know what? It's always a good time to have a bad relationship with the Lord. Go ahead, Daryl. Christ used his greatest motivation for the indifference of the people. His greatest motivation. His greatest motivation is to wake us up spiritually. That's what he wants to do. His greatest motivation is his endless love for us. It's hard for us to understand endless love because, you know, what we do. We, we, we love you, and then you get on our nerves, and we love you, and we get on there. He loves us endlessly. Endlessly. He wants to spend eternity with you. He wants to spend eternity with me. It's not enough just to shake us out of our spiritual apathy. It's not enough just to just shake us up. He wants, wants this for us to bring us to our knees and seek revival. Seek a better relationship with him. He'd love to provide eternity for all of us. You understand that you have royal blood flowing through your veins? I remember the first time I heard that royal blood in my veins. You know, what, what about me makes me royal? It's nothing about me, but it's who owns me and who loves me, who owns you and loves you. Royalty through your veins, running through. We are sons and daughters of the king of the universe. Not, not, not whoever you're of the universe. We can reign with him. We can sit on the throne with him forever if we choose to have revival. I'm going to read for you verse uh, 21. I didn't put it on the screen. It's Revelations. He says, To him 
who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to him. How many think they need a revival? I do. We can all, we can all have a better relationship with the Lord. We can all have our eyes open to see the things that we haven't been seeing before. It's always a better time to get a better relationship with the Lord. He's coming soon. Let's prioritize our Lord first and not last. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, Lord, today we have understood that there needs to be a revival within our life. One that's going to make our relationship with you much better than it was. Lord, we do not want to be labeled as the Laodicean church. One with an insipid attitude. One who has a lifeless faith. But Lord, we want a living faith. The Holy Spirit within us, living with us, leading us, and guiding us through. Lord, for all those that are in the audience or in the presence of my voice today, Lord, I'd like you to help them understand what they need to do to have a better relationship with you, Lord. Help them recognize that the time is not long. They need to do it today, not tomorrow. Lord, I ask you to continue to be with our church as we prepare ourselves to be in oneness, to do the work you've asked us to do. Lord, let us come together and inspire those around us to want to be a part of your kingdom one day. And Lord, when you come into the clouds, let everyone that hear me today look up and say, Lo, he is our God. We have waited for him. And Lord, we'll be thankful. Thank you so much. Forgive us for our sin. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.